Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another uh, Dhul Hijjah webinar brought to you by Pilgrim. My name is Adil and I'll be your host for this evening. Now, with Pilgrim, one of our flagship projects is Pilgrim Knowledge, where we're building the world's largest dedicated platform for learning about Hajj and Umrah in the English language, from courses to Q&A videos, as well as articles and webinars such as this. And as part of our Dhul Hijjah webinar series, today we get to hear about one of the most amazing women that have ever walked the face of the earth, Hajar, wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So many of us, we think about Hajar as being in the footsteps of Ibrahim, and rightly so. But how many of us realize that when we walk or run between Safa and Marwa, we're literally in the footsteps of his wife, Hajar? So today we'll be learning a lot more about her, her legacy, and taking lessons from her life that we can implement in ours. And uh, alhamdulillah, we have a wonderful speaker for you this evening, Ustada Safiya Dorat. Uh, Ustada Safiya is the lead instructor and founder of Al Muhsinat, an organization providing adult women with various opportunities to study Islamic sciences. And she herself has studied in Jordan, where she's covered topics like tafsir, Arabic, spirituality, as well as obtaining postgraduate qualifications at the Cambridge Muslim College and SOAS in London. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Ustada Safiya to begin today's presentation. Salam alaikum. Uh, this evening, Adil. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Nawaitu al-ta'allum wa al-ta'alim wa al-tadhakur wa al-tadhkir wa al-nafa' wa al-intifa' wa al-ifadata wa al-istifada wa al-hath ala al-tamassuk bi kitab Allah wa sunnati rasulihi wa dua ila al-huda wa al-dalalata ala al-khayr wa abtigha'a wajhi Allah wa mardatihi wa qurbihi wa thawabihi subhanahu wa ta'ala So assalamu alaikum everybody dear respected listeners um, I'm both humbled and honoured to share this platform today um, at the pilgrim to virtually gather to explore the life and lessons around our matriarch, our mother, the founder of some of the beautiful rites of Hajj, uh, Hajar alayhi salam. Now it's the season of Hajj and let us just start by reflecting on how important these days are, how precious these days are and just acknowledging that right now we're already on the 6th um, of the Hijjah from these beautiful um, and special days. So in the collection of Imam Tirmidhi, there is a saying of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that mentions that there are no days more beloved to Allah that be he be worshipped in than the 10 days of the Hijjah. Fasting every day in these days is like the equivalent of fasting a year. And standing every night in these nights is the equivalent of standing in the night of Qadr. So these are huge nights um, in terms of reward. So what we understand here is not that, you know, um, we need to calculate how many days we're fasting and how many years worth of fasting that is because our faith is not about numbers it's about the quality of intention and the quality of our hearts so what we understand here is overall there's a great emphasis and there's a great encouragement to increase in our acts of worship we should continue with the obligations that we're already doing and we should increase in the optional acts in these special days. It's like the sale of um, good acts. We should strive even harder to be good people. And, you know, if we haven't been doing so well with our obligations and, you know, everybody goes through periods in their life where um, they may be having lows and maybe um, neglecting certain important obligations of Islam, then there is no greater time to start now. Just like we're encouraged in Ramadan um, to continue and or to restart some acts that we've become neglectful of, right now is also a great season. There's so much barakah and blessings in these days that 
now would be a good time to to try and get into a good routine and rhythm um, of our obligations. So one of the ways that we can um, be inspired, one of the ways to reaffirm our faith, our spiritual stations, our spiritual activities, is to look to the lives of the prophets, the pious women, uh, the saints of the past. So here we are today, two days before Hajj officially starts, because Wednesday, the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, will be the official start of Hajj. Um, whether or not you've been for Hajj, I'm sure right now all of our hearts are yearning and longing to, to be there right now. Um, so let us start this evening by having a look at um, what we will be exploring tonight. Um, so there are five things that I thought we could look at um, just to feel a bit more inspired during these days, inshallah. So the first thing is just looking at the location of this story of, you know, where Hajar alayhi salam was, where she ended up with her family, and taking lessons just from the geography, because I think sometimes this part of the story can get um, missed out or not much emphasis is placed on this part of the story. The second thing is understanding what the story is from our sources. Sometimes um, we can get a bit confused and overly become reliant on the biblical sources um, and the pre-biblical sources. So here today we want to focus on what the traditions, what the prophetic sayings mention about this story. And then we want to just reflect and focus on how that story becomes and part of it becomes two very important parts and rights um, of Hajj. Um, so this is the Sa'i, and which is the running between the Safa and the Marwa, um, and drinking from the well of, of Zamzam. So these two in particular. And then we can move on. Um, and look and focus on the character and the spirituality of Hajar alayhi salam um, during these blessed days, what she did in her life, how we can feel inspired in these days, and how can we extend that inspiration into all days of the year, inshallah. And we will then conclude tonight um, with some final heartfelt personal reflections um, on, on this story and how we can extend it to different areas of our life. So let's look at the location now. Um, just a comment on the modern world. If we look at the modern world right now, traveling is very, very easy. Okay. If we were to put the lockdown to aside for, for a second, overall, traveling is very easy. For some people, especially before COVID-19, you could just, um, you know, before COVID came along, what happened? You could just go on lastminute.com. You could, um, you know, book a train ticket and you could literally get onto a train or an airplane and be you know, in a hot destination very quickly. Um, travel in the ancient world was not as easy. It wasn't a case of, you know, let's hop onto a train or get an airplane, get into our cars and, you know, find ourselves somewhere. Um, and it wasn't so much about money in the way, you know, travel has become about money today so you know in today's time if if you've got money you've got spare money then you know you'll you'll be a traveler you can be an adventurer um in those days it was more about courage um and one thing for sure though is whether you're an agent or somebody from the modern world um Travel for everyone, it brings about the opportunities of growth and the good fortune of learning. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, our patriarch, he was continuously traveling in his life. Uh, he was looking for somewhere to settle. And, you know, he had to leave areas because he wasn't able to uh, maintain his faith. So he moved from area to area in hope of finding people to convey the faith and the tawheed, the oneness of Allah um, with. So he was born between um, the two great rivers. So you have the Euphrates and the Tigris. 
So somewhere around that region, that's where um, we have some idea of where he was um, born. And then obviously he got married to Sarah alayhi salam. And at some point, he ended up in Egypt. Um, he ended up in Egypt, and in Egypt, that's where um, they were met with a tyrant king, and we'll focus on that part of the story soon. And when they were in Egypt, this is where they met and were gifted Hajar alayhi salam. So Hajar alayhi salam, she joins Ibrahim alayhi salam and Sarah alayhi salam in Egypt. Egypt. So they were all there in Egypt for some time, but then, you know, they had to leave Egypt. There were, there's no conclusive reason about why they had to leave uh, Egypt. There's many reasons, but we're not sure what reason um, is, is for certain. But they left Egypt and then they ended up in the land of Sham, um, which is around about the Palestine area today. So they moved from Egypt to Palestine. And then when Ibrahim Ali Salam, he left Palestine with um, his wife Hajar Ali Salam and his son Ismail Ali Salam, he left from Palestine to go to Mecca. So if you can see on this map over here, um, you know, on both maps, you can see Jerusalem to Mecca. We don't know exactly where he was in the Sham land. We can't be for sure. Um, but what we do know is it was around about that area. And obviously, we do know where the Kaaba is and where the Zamzam was. So Safa and Marwa, that's definitely the, the location um, where Ibrahim alayhi salam left them all. So look at this journey on Google Maps, um, just for us to understand it on our terms. If you were to make this journey, on a very simple route, um, because, you know, uh, the roads have been made much more um, convenient for travel in today's time. So if you look at the easiest route, it's about 15 hours and 43 um, minutes. Um, Ibrahim Ali Salam, Hajar Ali Salam and their son Ismail Ali Salam, they made this long journey um, with the simple means of transport available to them. It could have been a horse, it could have been a camel, we don't know what it was, but you know, put yourself in their air, in their midst, and understand that that was their journey. So for those of us um, that have been for Hajj or those of us that will go for Hajj or Umrah in the future, we should not forget how easy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made what used to be such a difficult journey. For us, it would be uh, a greater journey. It would be land and sea um, if it was in those times. Uh, for us, it's just a simple case of getting onto an aeroplane at Heathrow or wherever it is um, and ending up in um in Jeddah and a, you know and quite an easy route um to to Mecca so by their standards you know in those times it was very difficult um to travel by land you know traveling by water was was much easier than traveling by land um you know travel by land especially it was hard because uh you know some of the journey you'd have to walk some of the journey you'll be on your animal um you'd also have your provisions on your animal as well um so you'd be carrying something to sleep on um some food you know you'd have some of your supplies whatever you know even your pit stops, you wouldn't know where you would be stopping a lot of the time, whether people would be available. So you would have to really carry things with you um, to sustain you on that journey. And travel was obviously much more slower. So it was definitely not a case of 15 hours and 43 minutes. And just, you know, an interesting exercise. If you were to put on Google, Google Maps um, the journey from Jerusalem to Mecca, what you would find is there is no direct route um, to walk between uh, these two places. It takes you on a very long detour. So imagine this was a real journey for them. They de definitely didn't have to go on a detour. They, they probably took um, a safe route in a sense that it was one that was used frequently, but it didn't make that journey um, easy. And that's why whenever we travel, whether it's a greater journey like that of um, Hajj or that of Umrah, or whether it's a small journey to your local supermarket or store, um, you know, a park, wherever it is, 
meaningfully recite the travel dua and really connect yourself to people like Hajar Ali Salam who made huge journeys um, putting their faith and trust in Allah. So when we re- recite the dua, Subhanallahi Sakhara Lana Hada Wama Kunna Lahu Mukalilin Wa inna ila Rabbina Lamun Kalibun Glory be to him who has brought this So in those days, it would be an animal. In our days, it's a vehicle under our control. So glory be to him who has brought this under our control, though we are unable to control it ourselves. So, you know, in those days, you definitely wouldn't be able to control an animal yourself. And then we would say, and indeed to our Lord, we will surely return because you didn't know whether you would survive that journey or not. There would be predatory animals. There would be the fear of um, maybe not making it because of the heat, not having enough provisions with you. So when you make these journeys, whatever journey it is, when you read this dua, really connect um, with this story and just the meaning of that dua and, and how much emphasis we need to place on understanding the meanings of these duas. If you're a parent or if you have younger members um, in your family, ensuring that you recite this dua out loud, you really um, hone the point home of what this dua means, um, hopefully so that it's something that they can continue every time um, they they enter a vehicle or they ride an animal. And, and that's why, you know, even in today's time, there is an element of being connected with um, nature. And, you know, at some point do travel on horses and camels to get a feel and a sense of what travel on those animals feels like. Um, I know when I was in Jordan, uh, we took my my daughter, for instance, on um, a camel ride and she was absolutely petrified um, because it wasn't an easy, it wasn't the smaller camels that you get when you go for, um, you know, for Umrah and Hajj and the touristic places. If you were to go to a, a, a place with the, the big um, camels, you get an idea and a feeling of, you know, it's it's, it's huge animals and it's a, it's a bumpy ride. So alhamdulillah, the alhamdulillah for, you know, paved roads, um, ease of transportation, um, an abundance of uh, means of transportation. And alhamdulillah that it's not so much about a threat to life. So please do always remember to pray this dua um, on, on your journeys, inshallah. Okay, so that's just a bit about um, the geography, the location, the, the journey that they made with with a small child. She was still breastfeeding that child, Hajar Ali Salam. Um, you know, for for you ladies who have had children um, and you've breastfed your children, even if it's for a small amount of time, you know that in and of itself is exhausting. You have to have had you know enough provisions. You need to have at least a good amount of water. Um, but alhamdulillah, thum alhamdulillah, what you find in this journey is the journey has to be made and the reliance is placed on Allah subhanahu um, wa ta'ala. Okay, so let's move on to the next part. And this is just focusing on what we actually know. So let's pick up the story from when Ibrahim alayhi salam, he mar- married um, Sarah alayhi salam. They left their homeland um, in order to call people to Islam. So that's not easy. You know, imagine um, being in the place of a lot of displaced people in today's world. There are many displaced people have had to leave their homeland okay it might not be to call for islam but it's just to protect their own lives and for their safety so it's not easy ever to to leave your homeland to leave where you are um the conveniences that you've known so well and for so long and the luxuries that you've had so imagine they left their homeland and then somehow they ended up in egypt um and in that land there was a tyrant king um To cut a very long story short, um, this king, he wanted Sarah alayhi salam for himself. Um, There's lots of details to this, but I'm just going to focus on a few things. She prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she was protected from his evil advances and his evil intentions. And just a comment here, she was undisturbed 
on account of her faith. You know, it's not easy to have been um, separated in a foreign land from your husband, only then to be found in a situation where this strange person of authority in a foreign land wants to have um, evil intentions and evil sexual advances towards you. She was undisturbed. She knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would protect her. He would take her and get her out of that difficult um, situation. Now, each time this king tried to advance, what he found is his hand almost became paralyzed and he just, he almost freaked out by the presence of Sarah alayhi salam. Um, so in the end, uh, alhamdulillah, this king, uh, because of how strange he found this situation, he gifted Sarah alayhi salam, uh, Hajar alayhi salam. So she was actually a slave girl, an Egyptian slave girl. And she is the one that eventually goes on to bear Ismail alayhi salam. Um, she is the one that carries the first child of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now, um, when this story is narrated um, in the traditions, what you find is on one occasion, Abu Huraira radiallahu an, when he talks about this story, he pauses for a moment and he says to the listeners, she, meaning Hajar alayhi salam, is your mother, O oh Arabs. So it's, you know, Hajar alayhi salam, although she starts off as a slave girl, that doesn't um, in any way um, corrupt or belittle the beginning of the story of um, of Muslims from the line of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was mis he was faqir, he was a poor person, um, he was a leader of the poor people, he would give away all that he had in his home, you wouldn't really see much food, you know, whenever anything came in, he was, you know, readily giving it out, um, so that in no way, shape or form belittles the beginnings of Islam um, from the line of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, we, in fact, we're talking about her today because she is among the greats of um, the women of Islam, the women of um, Abrahamic faiths. Um, she is an example um, of a woman who is very clever, very humble, very strong, the likes of, um, you know, the wife of Pharaoh, Asiya alayhi salam, um, the mother of Isa alayhi salam, Maryam alayhi salam, the wife of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, and the mother of his children, mother of Fatima Khadija radiallahu anha. So we don't know much about the roots of Hajar alayhi salam, um, but these details are not the point you know in today's time and especially when you read Quranic stories they don't give you all these little and minor details because that is not the point of the story the the, the point of the story is and all these stories from the Quran and the Hadith are learning the greater lessons what can we take from these archetypal, uh, archetypal figures so what happens is um you know, from from Egypt, they all end up um, in, in Palestine, like I said. And we have a narration now from um, Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, and I'd really like to go through um, this narration right now so we understand what what's there in, in the narrations of hadith. So Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he brought Hajar, alayhi salam, and his son Ismail, alayhi salam, while she was suckling him to a place near the Kaaba. And this was under a tree, exactly on the spot of Zamzam. And that was at the highest place in that area. So where Zamzam was, that was, you know, quite high up um, at that time. Um, so the narration also mentions that during those days, there was nobody in Mecca. So imagine just having barren land. And that's what Mecca is, barren land, or it was mountains, you know, very few trees because there wasn't, you know, for trees, what do you need? You need water. There wasn't water in the area. So nor was there any water. So he had to, um, so he made them sit over there and he placed near them a leather bag. And listen to this. What did this le leather bag have? Some dates, uh, a small water skin containing some water. Um, and he set out homeward. Uh, Ismail alayhi salam's mother followed Ibrahim alayhi salam saying, 
O oh, Ibrahim, where are you going? You're leaving us in this valley where there is no person whose company we may enjoy, nor is there anything to enjoy. And she kept repeating that to him many times. But Ibrahim a.s., he did not look back at her. And then she asked him, okay, so look at this point now. Hadir a.s., you know, quite calmly was asking this question. She wasn't like nagging at him and having a go at him. She was just genuinely asking, you know, okay, um... And this is what any clever, intelligent person would do. You're left somewhere where it's quite clear it's not a place to sustain life. So you're questioning what's happening. Um, and now Ibrahim alayhi salam, he just was not responding. And Hajar alayhi salam, being the intelligent person that she was, the intelligent lady that she was, the intelligent mother that she was, um, the intelligent woman of faith, um, she paused and... Uh, she asked Ibrahim alayhi salam, has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered you to do this? Because it didn't make any logical sense for her husband to do this. And she knew it was out of character for him to do this. So she realized it would only be on account of Allah's order that he would do this. So finally he replied and he said, yes. So then she said, then Allah will not neglect us. And she returned to her son, who whilst Ibrahim a.s. proceeded onwards. So he was continuously walking onwards, making his way home. And she was just left where today's Zamzam is. Um, obviously, geographically, it doesn't look the same as it was in her time. But just imagine what it looked like at that time. How many of us would just return to that spot? Just pause for a moment and, and think about that. It's, it's really um, and truly not an easy thing to do. Now, when she reached um, the peak of that area, that Zemzem spot, um, and obviously Zemzem's not even there yet, she couldn't even see him anymore. But what happened is when he, he when Ibrahim a.s. walked, uh, you know, a bit away where he wasn't to be seen, he made a dua, and this dua um, is on the screen right now. And he said, oh, Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyati. بواد غير ذي زرع عند بيتك المحرم ربنا ليقيم الصلاة فجعل أثئدة من الناس تهوي إليهم وارزقهم من الثمرات لعلهم يشكرون He said, O oh our Lord, I have made some of my offspring dwell in a valley without cultivation meaning I've just left my family there and there's nothing there, Ya Allah by your sacred house. So obviously Kaaba wasn't there, but he must have known at that point um, that there would be a, a sacred place in, in the future. And why did he do that? In order, O oh our Lord, that they may offer prayers perfectly. He knew that, you know, inshallah, in future, this place will become a place of prayer, inshallah. So fill some hearts among men with love towards them. And O oh Allah, provide them with fruits so that they may give thanks. And if you look, subhanAllah, because Zamzam ended up being there and it became, um, you know, a well of life, literally a well of life, a source of life, because if you have water, you can have agriculture, you can have food, fruit, vegetables, all of that. People can um, nourish themselves by drinking it as well. So alhamdulillah, they had that. Um, and so Ibrahim alayhi salam, it must have been such an emotional experience, but he still had to place his trust in Allah. He had that guarantee in his heart that Allah was going to take care of this. And we really need to have that trust and reliance in the same sense of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Hajar alayhi salam. We are never put in circumstances similar to, to these two individuals um, in our faith, in our tradition, from our history. But yet, you know, despite us having so many luxuries around us, we still fail and struggle many a time to have the station of trust and reliance. You know, in Islamic talks, we're always talking about have tawakkul and, you know, we always say tawakkul on Allah. But it's not until you're tested and put on the brink of things in the way that Hajar Ali Salam was that you really and truly understand what um, tawakkul is. And so we don't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to test us in our faith 
um, and in our deen. But in our dunya, we will be tested. You know, many of my teachers mention that in the world, we will be tested. And if we're not tested in our dunya, then this world wouldn't be the world for us. It would become our jannah. We want to go to jannah. We want to um, live in, um, you know, endless bliss in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what do we find here? The lesson is, is that Hajar alayhi salam, she just, she walks on, she continues, she marches on, she she continues her life. She's an example of somebody that doesn't come to standstill. When we have uh, experienced pain, we shouldn't neglect that pain. When we experience um, trials and tribulations and grief, it may be through bereavement, it may be through separation and loss, whatever it is, we should not um, put our whole life on hold. We need to find ways of continuing. And even, you know, continuing doesn't mean, you know, continuously doing the same things that we were, but continuing, continuously finding a way forward in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what did Ibrahim alayhi salam do? He made this beautiful dua. And we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that no supplication is quicker to be answered than a supplication on behalf of one absent. So he couldn't physically do anything for his wife. He couldn't physically do anything for his son. But what did he do? He made dua for them. And so when we are going through difficult circumstances, we have the story of Hajar alayhi salam. She knew that she would have the dua of her husband. She knew she had the divine care of Allah subhanahu um, wa ta'ala. So she just continued forward, alhamdulillah. So obviously Ismail alayhi salam, he was suckling at the time. Um, when she finished drinking the water from the water skin and all that water had been used up, she obviously became thirsty and her baby become, became thirsty. He must have been crying at that time. And, you know, a baby that's thirsty and hungry for its mother's milk, you know, those cries are so distressing for a mother to hear. Um, so she started to look at Ismail alayhi salam and she was tossing... Um, and, and you know Ismail at that point he was tossing in agony so she left him for a moment because she couldn't look at him it was it was so difficult for her to see him at that moment and then she she started you know looking around her and she found um that the mountain of Asafa was nearest to her so she stood on it she looked at, at the valley and she was hoping that she could see somebody but she couldn't see anyone so then she came down and she checked on her son again. And then obviously he's still in the same state, in the same situation. She tucked her robe in um, and like a person running in distress and trouble, um, she ran all the way up to Marwa and she stood and she started looking again. She was hoping, really hoping somebody would be there, but she couldn't see anyone. And she did this running backwards and forth uh, between Safa and Marwa. Um, you know, seven times. If we were to calculate that, we don't know how much of an incline that was, but just in today's time, when we do the walk between Safa and Marwa, and there's no incline, you're walking on flat plain land, alhamdulillah, it's 3.6 kilometers, 3.6 kilometers. But imagine she had no AC, she wasn't indoors, she had the heat above her head, she had the distress and, you know, the distressful cries of her child, but she still continued. Alhamdulillah, she didn't give up. Um, and then all of a sudden she heard a sound um, and it came from where her child was, Ismail alayhi salam. So she came down and she had a look and it was actually the sound of an angel. And it was actually the angel Jibreel alayhi salam who had struck his wing on the ground till water started coming out of the land. And imagine the face of this mother, subhanAllah, um, who was frantically uh, just trying to find a way to quench her child's thirst and hunger. And she finds out of nowhere this well come out of this land, uh, what looked like very dry land, subhanAllah, comes gushing out of nowhere. So she looked at it and she thanked Allah. You know, we often in times of um, happiness and pleasure, we can forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, simple things, Eid comes, we pray the salah and sometimes we forget the other salahs or we forget to do zikr in the day or pray some Quran. 
it's you know in moments of pleasure that's even more important uh, to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's exactly uh, what she did but she started saying zamzam zamzam and zamzam means stop stop because what she was doing is she was trying to create almost like a basin around the area with with mud and the clay because obviously the area around it was now wet. Um, she wanted it to stop so that she could preserve the water and it could continue for her. So obviously that's the human element there that, you know, who, who wouldn't, upon seeing water in a land where there's no water, uh, want to save that for her and, and her child. And it's because of her clever thinking, you know, her, you know, her quick, instincts and alhamdulillah her motherly instincts um that we still have uh that zamzam today and and we still call it zamzam subhanallah and there's so many benefits from drinking um the the water of of zamzam now if we look at um a series of uh talks on leadership by sheikh abdul hakim murad he actually um dedicates a whole lecture to Hajar alayhi salam because he says that she is actually an example of what it means to be a true leader in the Islamic sense. To be an imam in the Islamic sense is to have um, an inward excellence, to be able to lead yourself, to be able to hold the the reins within you know you know, to be able to practice that self restraint and that self uh, control. You know you know culture of just do it and just eat um that's what we find ourselves in and especially with covid that's what everybody has been doing just ordering things and eating things and really and truly hajra ali salam is a great example of of being a true imam um so leadership of the self is one of the most important things and so she was leading herself but subhanallah look at how well she led herself and how well she was on the station of of tawakkul um that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made her a, a leader in in the other sense where she is now leading us every single year um at the hajj in the sari where we follow in her footsteps and we start from safa and we continue to Marwa and we go upwards and downwards for 3.6 kilometers, probably a little bit less than her, um, to reenact what she did selflessly to provide um, for her child, subhanAllah. Um, so we have a leader in a spiritual sense and a leader um, in, in these rites of Hajj and, and these acts of um, Ibadah. So um, we just sort of broke off talking about um, the example of the leadership in Hajar alayhi salam that she was a leader of the self and then now you know she is a true leader because you know we follow in her footsteps you know how many religions and how many acts do we actually follow a female in and when we're doing the sa'i we are literally following in the footsteps walking in the footsteps of Hajar um, alayhi salam um, she is the foundress of um, two of the rites so if we just look at um, what we have is um, when we are doing Umrah and we're doing Hajj as well so on um, Wednesday when the Hujjaj um, are starting off the rites of Hajj and they do their Tawaf they will drink from the well of Zamzam inshallah that beautiful water they will pray their Dua and they will be remembering Hajar Ali Salam and the difficulties that she went through and a lot of the times when we're looking for examples, uh, whether it's religious or not religious, we're looking at like, you know, the top three qualities of really successful people, whether it's religiously or um, in the world and leadership, whatever it is. Um, but, you know, very seldom do we have examples of broken people being uh, exemplars, archetypal figures. But really and truly, when we look in the Quran, when we look in that ahadith, when we look at our traditions, it is many of these broken figures are the ones 
that are our archetypes because it's when we are broken down when we are at our lowest when we face the most difficult scenarios and situations do we then gain these beautiful stations before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you look at Hajar alayhi salam she is a mutawakkila she is a woman of absolute trust and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we don't see her praying you know, lots of extra salahs in that time. We don't see her doing extra dhikr at that time. You know, we do see her reliance in Allah in, in her language. So when Ibrahim alayhi salam left her, she did say, Hasbun Allah. Some narrations say, she said, Raditu billah, I'm pleased with Allah, or Allah is enough for me. But a lot of the times, faith is not about how many extra acts you can do. It's about the quality of heart. It's not to undermine and belittle giving sadaqah, doing extra salah, and you know fasting more, and doing all of these excellent and amazing acts of worship, because they definitely are means to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you know, for some people, their circumstances may not allow them to do all these extra acts of worship. But if they can live in the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they can live and attain stations in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that will be sufficient for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate a person spiritually. So Haji Ali Salam, all she was doing is doing what any mother on this earth would do, is she was selflessly trying to provide for her child in this, under very difficult circumstances. She, she selflessly did that. But the added layer is, is she put her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So she was doing what she had to do. She still, you know, looked and searched because that's what humans do. We have to do that. Allah has given us the means on this earth to look for provision. We do that. But we do not do it bereft of that reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, according to some narrations, Hajar alayhi salam and her son Ismail alayhi salam are actually buried in, you know, the, uh, the Hajar area next to the Kaaba, um, the, the area that was meant to be incorporated into the Kaaba, but it wasn't. Um, and we still do tawaf around um, that area. So subhanAllah, like um, she's got such a remarkable honor and position um, in our tradition, in, in Islam, subhanAllah. She is not a marginal figure. This lady who was a slave and then becomes a wife of a prophet, mother of a prophet, was no marginal figure because she then becomes the founder of uh, the Sa'i and she is um, the, the one that held the area and the space of Zamzam. She protected that water. And later on, when uh, people started to travel past that area on their journeys, they started to see birds in the area. And you would often see birds in areas where there was water. So travelers during that time, they would go to that area and they would find Hajar alayhi salam and Ibrahim uh, Ismail alayhi salam, her son, and they would want to um, use some of the water. So she would welcome everybody because that was what their family was about, generosity, being very hospitable. You know, Ibrahim Ali Salam, he is the one that's known for being so hospitable to anybody that came, his family as well, Sarah alayhi salam. Um, so even Hajar alayhi salam, very hospitable, very welcoming. She allowed anybody to come. But the one condition was that whoever comes here, she is the guardian of the Zamzam because she wanted to allow access for all. So look at her. So her selflessness, for her child and her selflessness for the community of people that then started to live around her. So she really looked out for everyone um, around her, subhanAllah. And I think it was just yesterday or the day before, um, Dr. Ingrid Matson, um, she gave an excellent um, presentation and talk on the family um, of Ibrahim Ali Salam. And she talks about the role um, of women traditionally and in the ancient world and even um, in more recent times um, before colonialism, where it was the women that were the guardians um, uh, of, of these worlds, they were the water bearers. And obviously with colonialism and just the nation states, she mentions how that's been taken away and women had very important roles in society and then they were marginalized. Um, 
when you know the structure of society has changed so alhamdulillah you know hajj alayhi salam it wasn't a small task to um safeguard this water and to ensure you know free right for water for all alhamdulillah but she did that so she is no marginal figure her story subhanallah she was abandoned she was in isolation almost you know we we know somewhat what isolation feels like but no way on the terms of hajar islam we have our fridges and our freezers that are fully stocked you know even when people were stockpiling i'm sure in our homes we had enough to keep us going um but we had a taste of what it felt like to be isolated you know from people from you know are the luxuries that we have um so in these difficult situations we have to look for inspiration to others in our tradition that have gone through this and hajar is a beautiful example of human excellence and her leadership is one of moral leadership you know she was disadvantaged she had you know endless troubles facing her alhamdulillah she was an exemplar for all of us and she still is so this zamzam on account of her Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose her it was at the at her hands and her son's hands that this zamzam was protected um for all of us and again zamzams become uh, another um easy to get to luxury it's it's no longer luxury you get them in these bottles i'm not belittling that in any way it's amazing that we can have zamzam so um easily and readily available alhamdulillah and to give somebody you know the gift of zamzam is is beautiful but do you remember like when you were younger i remember when i was younger and people used to come back from hajj and they would have uh maybe just one big bottle of zamzam and then they would have to mix that with a bit of normal water or give really small amounts of zamzam so as many visitors could taste from that beautiful um water and mubarak water um of of zamzam subhanallah so these are you know beautiful things that we have on account of hajar ali salam really appreciate these gifts you know she gifted us you know a lot of people chose hajar ali salam and ismail ali salam through them for us to be gifted this um healing water of zamzam that we all yearn to have to open our fast with uh when we go to saudi it's you know when we go to mecca for the umrah uh it's something that you can just drink and your heart and your your um your stomach is never um satiated enough when it drinks zamzam there's always um you know space for for that bit more of zamzam subhanallah so these stories are there to tell us essential lessons and the essential lessons are um right here so you know there's many lessons but let's have a few lessons here um one of these lessons is to have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we've talked about this um endlessly today you know having that trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is important it's not the trust where we just say you know tawakkal on Allah it's if you're faced with a situation where it sort of forces you to have trust always choose that trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't make it an option for yourself in anything the first thing that we should do is turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we're going for a driving test trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I'll pass um if you know somebody's married and they're having marital difficulties trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're married and you can't have children put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look at Ibrahim alayhi salam he put his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in old age Allah gave him children it's don't think it's just ibrahim alayhi salam even in today's time people who are older in you know what's conceived you know an age of giving birth they're still giving birth alhamdulillah allah will put things in your path and if he doesn't put your trust in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that for every thing that you seek in this world that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give you he will replace it with something far greater in the hereafter or even something greater in this world but have that trust in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are not living for this world we are living for the hereafter and also the story of selflessness now there is a big push um in um campaigns and initiatives for taking care of ourselves 
absolutely true. We should take care of ourselves and we should take care of our mental well-being, our physical well-being, our spiritual well-being, absolutely necessary. But this um, religion and this way is a way of community. And it's, you know, the way where if one, you know, the hadith mentions that we are like one body. The ummah is like one body. If one part of the body is hurting, it's as though all parts of the body um, are hurting. Likewise, if you know, one part of the ummah is suffering, it's like we're all suffering. We should feel like that. Um, we have to have that sense of selflessness where we're able to put others before our own selves. And we do that beautifully when it comes to Ramadan, when it comes to giving our zikr and sadaqah, and hopefully like supporting something like this Umrah fund that we have. But, you know, this selflessness, it needs to be manifest more in our day to day. So when we're living with our neighbors and we're struggling with something just to, um, you know, to just turn away from things and just overlook things. And hopefully that good character of yours will draw people more to, to the religion of Islam because of your good character. It's not to say that, you know, you tolerate abusive behavior and you let people, you know, trample over you and you have no boundaries, but there should, should be a greater part of our life where we give more than we take, or we focus more on what we have to give than what we take because unfortunately in relationships today we're all focused on me myself and I so you come back in the house and you're worried about um you know uh all the things that haven't been done for you and you're not really worried about your other half or your children um that's not healthy in any relationship what's healthy is to think about what you can give and then when you receive something you'll be really really grateful but if we're always focusing on ourself me myself and i then what ends up happening is it's never enough whatever we have it's it's never enough and and that's why in this society of um you know this youtube culture where we have lots of sort of um islamic um sort of identities influences whatever they are um not all of them are you know ones that you know i wouldn't encourage you to follow right it's not a, a sense of following but you have to choose the people that you let into your life whether that's in the virtual world or in the physical world when you're meeting physically one another or when you're watching things online and unfortunately online what's happening is these people are not archetypal figures they don't have these essential qualities a lot of these people are making a living through selling products through advertising not all of them, but many of them are. And what ends up happening is instead of us being selfless, we focus on ourselves, our needs, what we want. When really and truly there's very few things in life we need to survive. Look at the story of Hajj Ali Salam. They're just worried about their basic needs. But here we are in today's society, always worried about changing our furnishings seasonally, um, changing our homes, the shape, size. Um, traveling you know endlessly when look at this this is such a good initiative uh maybe if we have the opportunity of going for umrah every single year how many of us would be able to be so selfless that one year we were to gift somebody a whole umrah you know, if it's in your means subhanallah so that's the the message um of selflessness and it's not just about a mother's selflessness towards her child it's just as a society ibrahim salam, he was always being selfless as well it was men and women being selfless um but there is a comment here i'd like to share from um Sheikh Nuh Keller, who mentions about motherhood and this is important because with motherhood society can sometimes belittle that role you know okay what are you doing are you just a mother are you so you're not working when really you're a full-time worker um when when you're at home so he mentions that when she has her first baby she must manage for another life even more dependent on her personal sacrifices by the second third or fourth child her days and nights belong almost entirely to others whether she has a spiritual path or not such a mother 
can seldom resist a glance at the past where she where there were more prayers more meanings more spiritual company and more serenity when allah opens her understanding she will see that she is engaged in the in one of the most highest forms of worship that of producing new believers who love and worship allah she is effectively worshiping allah for as many lifetimes as she has children for the reward of every spiritual work her children do will be hers without diminishing anything of her own rewards. Every ablution, every prayer, prayer, every Ramadan, every Hajj, and even the works her children will in turn pass on to their offspring and so on till the end of time. Even if her children do not turn out as she wishes, she will be requited in paradise forever according to her intention in raising them which was that they should be godly. Aside from this tremendous reward, within the path itself, it is noticeable that many women who seclude themselves in, in vicar are the women who have raised children. They are the ones that attain the higher stations, subhanAllah. So what we find is women, uh, or even men who make huge sacrifices, um, especially as parents or as teachers, um, as older siblings that might be look after their, looking after their younger siblings, whoever it is, what you will find, inshallah, inshallah, your sacrifices will not go in vain, inshallah, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala listens to all your sacrifices, all your selflessness actions, and you are rewarded for everything that you don't get to do to help somebody in their religious activity, you'll be rewarded as long as your obligations are not overlooked. That's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks of you, as long as your obligations are not overlooked. Inshallah, thumma inshallah. And the third lesson that we have here is a lesson of resilience, not to give up. Nobody is a loser in this world in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as you continuously believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your Lord, He is the one Lord, He is, you know, your Rabb, the divine, caring, nurturing Lord, then there's no reason to give up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there. You are never, ever alone. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his whole life is an example of that. The life of Hajar alayhi wa sallam is an example of that. She, you know, imagine being a slave girl, thinking, where am I going to end up, you know? Not much prospects for a woman like that. But subhanallah, Allah had something great in store for her. And when she, you know, she must have thought things are getting really good now. I've got a child or the, you know, wife of a lovely person, the like of Ibrahim alayhi salam. But then all of a sudden things change uh, all over again. And she's left in, in Mecca. But subhanAllah, this woman is a woman of resilience. Hasbi Allah, raditu billah. She says Allah is enough and sufficient for me. And alhamdulillah, she is... Um, putting her trust in Allah. So continue with resilience. So for us, we want to use every trial and tribulation in our life, see them as openings for growth, openings for attaining spiritual stations with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just before we conclude today, that's why my personal reflections from this story is one of acceptance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written your story for you. And you have to accept what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got in store for you. There is no point in arguing or being disappointed with your share in life. Because for everything that we feel disappointed in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have something far greater in store in a place where it matters more. And that's Jannah, inshallah. So continuously accept, you know, say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you accept the, the state that you're in. And there's a beautiful dua for this. Oh Allah, make me content with what you have provided me. Send me blessings um, therein and replace for me every absent thing with something better. So anything that I haven't received or I've asked for and it's not there, give me something greater. The next thing is dua. Dua is our lifeline. It was Ibrahim alayhi salam's lifeline. 
he left them, his family, Hajar alayhi salam, and Ismail alayhi salam, his young child, it can't have been easy. But what kept him strong was dua. And here is, so we have the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam then, but just this dua of acceptance. What a beautiful dua it is. So, and the most beautiful du'as are the du'as that come from our hearts. So we have the du'as of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi which are beautiful as well. But, you know, if you make a du'a in a state of um, loss, a state of grief, a state of difficulty, a state of tri- tribulation, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will listen to your du'as. And over and above that, if we can continuously make dua even in moments where we're happy what a good combination inshallah so can, this is your communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and finally the importance of the family unit hopefully covid situation has um refocused our the importance of um family life um for all of us it's opened that up for us again inshallah it's made us focus on family again but if we want the ummah to go forward as families we have to be stronger alhamdulillah right now what do you see so many households their households have become masajid because children are giving the adhan um you know sometimes you might only find husband and wife together and they're praying the salah five times a day in the home of families and individuals that were struggling to make a routine of salah they've been able to do that we give our kids and the next generation to the masajid and the imams and the the teachers to really bring up our children but the best way to bring up the next generation is from within the home so really and truly, if we are able to make our homes the masajid that they've become right now, if we are able to make our homes one of good character where you see the mother and father having you know reliance and trust, you have the children that are just really um, trying to uh, replicate all the good qualities that they see in their parents, inshallah, inshallah, we can see a stronger generation um, of, of Muslims, inshallah. So these are just a few thoughts and reflections tonight on the story of Hajar alayhi salam. And I hope that we can really take from these lessons and really grow in these days. Um, we want to to our accept um, all the intentions and the efforts of the organisers. And I hope that inshallah we are all able to support the, um, the gift of Umrah tonight. Assalamu alaikum. 